Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name's Jason Newland, this is ASMR Whisper, let me bore you to sleep. So this is just a, I guess a, a softly spoken whisper version of the Let Me Bore You To Sleep podcasts that I've been doing for about four years. By the way, that's my cardigan I'm unzipping, in case you think something weird's happening. Um, I've actually got about 911 of those Let Me Bore You To Sleep podcasts. I think this is number six of the ASMR whisper ones. <laughs> so, there's a, you know, I've got a little bit of catching up to do. So what I thought I would do is... Kind of, oh yeah, only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And I think I'm going to kind of do what I did yesterday and go through the news, try and find some nice stories, nice stories. So if I go to Fox News, because I did the BBC News yesterday, let me see if there's any nice stories on the Fox News website. Nope, that's negative. The amount of negative titles is phenomenal. Um, just weird. I um. Yet, I can't really figure it out because I I would have thought that people would enjoy reading nice things, you know, like nice stories, happy things, you know, good news. I thought that that would just make sense to me that that would be something that would be interesting, you know, hearing about. You know, I'm not, I do like hearing about medical advances or you know, scientific discoveries, things like that. But, you know, also on a human level, it's, it's nice to, to hear about something that's just, you know, almost life affirming, you know. But hey, we'll find something. So... And nothing so far. Oh, it's a bit hot in here. It's a weird, it's a weird time of year. Because it's the end of October, and it, it's you know it's a really bright day today. I'm going to go for a walk after this, but the temperature sort of. It just changes so quickly. It's, you know, the heating's on automatic, so it comes on when it needs to. Sometimes it comes on when it, I don't think it is needed. And other times it doesn't come on when I've got icicles, you know, hanging off my ears. Uh, Okay, banned Halloween costumes, banned. To There's literally. I. Uh, I'm waiting. Well, this is quite funny. Okay, I'm going to read this. Biden makes fun of reporters with faces, imitations in latest incident, insulting the press. For me, that's a positive thing, surely. I mean, 
the press have got so much to answer for. Even for me, you wouldn't believe it, honestly. Um, you might think, well, you, who are you? Well, I'm Jason, hi. In 1993, I was doing this comedy gig. And it was downstairs at the King's Head. I remember it very well. And this, I think it was after we got off, after I got off stage, and it was like the end of the evening, this, I think it was a lady, a lady came up to us, to me, and to another comedian, and said, uh, and introduced herself, and said, I'd like to do a newspaper article on you, both. And I said, okay. And she'd already taken pictures of us on stage. So I didn't, you know, I didn't mind that. I didn't really care. Well, she was really friendly. And she said that she liked what I did and all that stuff. And then she told me what day the article would be in. And it was in the Independent. So it wasn't like a tabloid. It was a proper... You know, well, what we class is a kind of a serious paper, and it was a it was a newspaper that I used to read. I used to like the Independent. Didn't understand all the words, but but I used to feel kind of clever reading it. I think. Anyway. I was all excited about this newspaper article coming out because I thought, ah, oh, this could, this could, you know, enhance or even create my career because at that point things weren't going great. It was, I was just plodding along, doing open spots and getting the occasional paid gig and just travelling around London and the outskirts of London for three years up to that point. And when it came out, it was a Wednesday. I'm pretty sure it's a Wednesday. 1993. I think about September. I don't ha I used to have the newspaper. I kept it for about 20 years and then I... I don't know, I must have chucked it away. Anyway, the headline, they actually had a headline on the first, on the front cover of the, of the newspaper. It was like a small headline in the corner, you know, go to page, I think it was the center pages. I was actually on the center pages. So go to the, go to page 42 or whatever, meet Britain's worst comedian. That's what it said. Seriously. Now, I wasn't the best comedian, but I wasn't the worst comedian. I had some pretty bad gigs, but at, at that point, I was starting to get okay. I was starting to... It was, you know, just things were starting to sort of turn around. Anyway. <laughs> I laugh now, but it wasn't, you know funny really oops banging stuff and she yeah anyway I got the newspaper inside there was a picture of me standing there with my long hair smoking a cigarette black and white picture it was a cool picture it was actually quite a good picture and it took up pretty much the whole of half of the middle for this article on the other side, there was a, a newspaper article about Mike Tyson going to prison or something. So that's kind of that period, 93, and that's when he went to prison. Yeah, I think it was 93. Anyway, so I, I read the article, and at no bit, no point in the article did it say anything bad about me, but it did about the other comedian that they were reviewing and she she did talk about me and she said 
uh, what Jason is saying is horrible, but it's funny. You know, the audience are laughing and so am I. That was her words. Yet, I'd never lived, well, you know, for quite a while I didn't live that down. It's almost like every single comedian on the circuit read that article and I was a laughing stock for all the wrong reasons. People were laughing for the first time. <laughs> And it was just, just ridiculous. I mean, it was horrible. It was really, you know, I wasn't the best. I didn't enjoy the process. I didn't enjoy that. And that was tiny, a tiny thing. Um, I remember there was this, my only other real example I've been in the newspaper since then for when I was doing the free pain relief service, but that was in 2006. So yeah, 11 years, no, 13 years later, but that was positive. That's a very positive. The only thing I didn't like about it is I don't know why. Why do photographers in newspapers and even television shows choose to do such close up pictures very few people look good really close up on a camera especially a lot of really good camera like a television camera you know it's it's a really unflattering angles they do and they did a picture of me and I just looked absolutely awful in this you know but never mind anyway it was a good article I've still got the paper I think I think I have somewhere so I um, oh yeah in 1990 I think it was in the 90s early 90s there was a, a lady who she had a relationship with a married politician who was very famous at the point well, became more famous because of that but he was in the cabinet on the front bench you know and she, the, the thing is apparently she used to wear a Chelsea Antonio Dissenters, I think her name was. And she used to wear a, a Chelsea football t-shirt when they were together. And it was this huge story. And she was encouraged to sell the story to the tabloid press. And I think he lost his job. And it was huge news in this country. It was ridiculously huge. For I couldn't really understand why. But she was hated. I think it was that football connection. I don't know. But she really. Um, for some reason. The, the public didn't like her. Because of it. Now I didn't realise how bad it was. Until it was 90. Probably early. Early in 1998. I had lunch with her, or had an evening meal with her, because she came, she was, she, she was with her, she was with her boyfriend, who was friends with a friend of my friend, if that makes sense, so they came in and they invited me to have, have dinner with them in the club, so I did, and I was sitting opposite her, and the other, oh yeah, the other lady, I'd known her for years. She was a, a fashion designer in London. And she just happened to be a friend of my friend. And she was always friendly to me from 91. Or, you know, so I was saw her every now and then. I didn't know her well, but like, you know, she was just nice. Apparently quite, quite a well-known fashion designer, but well, since the 60s. I didn't, I didn't know what her name was, I didn't learn it, 
but she was always friendly and she was always, always like dressed really um, outlandishly as well. So, yeah, I used to talk, actually, yeah, I did just remember, I did actually know her fairly well, because she used to tell me about her business, and she had a, a, a shop just around the corner, I think, in Shoreditch, or some studio or something. Anyway, she was friends with Antonio DeSantis' boyfriend at the time, I don't know, they might be married now, I don't know, and he was a genius with, like, in an artistic way, he did some kind of renovating expensive cars, but apparently he was, like, just on a different level, so him and the other, like, anyway, I'm, this me, it's getting all confusing, isn't it, I end up sitting opposite Antonio, the lady from the newspaper and she was I don't know you I don't normally use this word but she was delightful it's a very posh word isn't it she's very delightful she was lovely absolutely lovely I'm not talk I'm not talking about how she looked I'm talking about her personality she was funny she was friendly she was open she told me all about the stuff that happened you know um, how it happened, and she she also sort of told me that she'd had to move out of the country, her own country, where she was born and lived. She moved to Australia to get away because people were being aggressive to her, like in the street. She because she was she couldn't get away from it, so she moved to Australia, and I think that's where she met this man because I think he might have been Australian. I made that last bit up. I've got no idea if it's true. It sounds good though. Well, it sounds... It, it, it sounds like it fits together with the story. Anyway, so I'm sitting there with Antonio and she is absolutely lovely. You know, she's... You couldn't wish for a nicer, friendlier dinner companion. And I know she wasn't my dinner companion, you know, she was with her boyfriend and we were just there together, but she was funny, very funny. And I enjoyed it, enjoyed her company. She went uh, for a poo or a wee or something, went to the toilet. I didn't ask her which. Actually, I probably did when she got back because that's kind of the kind of thing that I would do. And she was really upset. And I was like, what's, what's going on? And she said that a couple of the women had a go at her. Not physically, but they were verbally abusive to her. Still, like, this is five years after the event, they were still remembered her. And at one point, she came back, sat down. I imagine the women went back to their table because it was on a Thursday night in the comedy club, and I was I was associated with the comedy club, and the some blokes stood up and started shouting. There, there was a, like a football song that had been made up about her, and they started singing it. So I kind of stood up and said, "Stop." And I'm not sure if I went over there and told them to sit down. I can't remember, but, because I was part of the club, so I, not that I had authority, but I weren't going to put up with that, you know, you see, I've always had this thing, yeah, when it comes to, if it's a comedy club, it should be a friendly environment, I think everywhere should be a friendly environment, but that's my weird brain, my naivety. But a comedy club, people go to have a laugh, to have fun, without aggression, without any of that stuff. Uh, I didn't realise that when I was doing comedy, because I was quite aggressive when I first started. I used to shout at the audiences. This is back in 1991. I stopped doing that after the first year. But I used to really be quite insulting 
because that's the kind of comedy that I liked. Uh, but I was only 20, so I was quite young. I was only 42. No, I was tw I was fairly fairly young lad, and I was very immature back then. I'm still very immature as well. So I kind of seen firsthand from a personal experience, and also from hearing what someone else has told me from a much, much, much bigger uh, version of events. You know, someone that's been in the tabloids and became a famous or infamous overnight. And millions and millions of people knew her name. Now, I had, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand people might have seen my picture. Some of them might have read the article. Most probably would have just forgotten it as soon as they'd read it. Because it was meaningless. It, it didn't have any anything to it. It wasn't interesting, really, I don't think. But the wrong people read it for me, like every single, uh, every, every comedy promoter, owner or, you know, of a comedy club, probably every comedian, it's just, it's almost like everybody read it, and this is before the internet, blimey, if that had been on the internet, that would have ruined, it would have ruined it, or oh, who knows, it might have created a buzz, you don't know, who knows, I mean, if I'd have been posting videos of myself on YouTube from my videos, you know, if I'd have videoed myself on stage and posted them on YouTube, you know, if it had been now, and I was a 20 year old, I might have gained a following, you know, for being notorious or something, I don't know. Um, but by 2003, the thing is, by 2000, no, 1993, sorry, I wasn't like that anymore, I wasn't aggressive, I was doing kind of political humour, a few dirty jokes chucked in, but I was, I was starting to develop uh, my own voice, I guess. I mean, my voice is very well developed now, but it's, you know, it's just me, and that's the one thing, one of the, probably one of the benefits of doing regular podcasts, or I guess videos, you know, vlogging, stuff like that, you kind of get to sort out who you are as a person because almost if you take away the filter and just allow yourself to just be you or if I'll talk from my own perspective I'll just allow myself to just to be myself who I, I do I'm not a terrible person really you know I've, I make these silly podcasts and I talk about absolute rubbish sometimes and but I don't think I come across as a well to me I don't I don't <laughs> maybe to others I do but I don't I don't think I come across too bad really as a I mean as, as far as being a human a human so yeah Anyway, I don't know how I got into that. Let's talk about President Biden. President Biden, this is on foxnews.com. President Biden appeared to mock reporters as they shouted questions at him during a meeting with Israel President Isaac Herzog at the White House on Wednesday. By the way, those listening, President Biden, he's the US, United States President. Not everybody might know that. Some people might be listening to this and thinking, well, why did you, why did you say Israeli 
president, but he didn't say what President Biden was. See, there might be people in other countries that don't know. I don't know. I don't know who knows what knows when and how much, you know. <laughs> that wasn't even a sentence, was it? So Biden hosted the Israeli president to announce a new agreement between Israel and Lebanon during a bilateral meeting in Washington. Let's have a look. Oh, okay. It says at the conclusion of the meeting, both leaders who were seated opposite each other turned their attention to reporters in the back of the room. The two men sat in silence as a raucous press corps shouted questions at them. Biden could be seen imitate, imitating reporters, raising his eyebrows and moving his mouth to silently mimic talking. He was also seen laughing and slapping his knee before reporters were escorted out of the room. I've seen so many of these situations where politicians are being shouted at by reporters and journalists. And some of the things that the journalists shout out are so rude. I don't mean like sweary, but just rude and obnoxious. And I'm I'm surprised because I don't think I'd have the the calmness to keep quiet, the uh, ability to not shout stuff out. That's why, regardless of what anyone thinks about former president uh, before Biden. If there was a if there was a, a journalist or a reporter that was rude, he'd kick them out of the room. I respect that. I do. If someone's going to come in and just be rude and obnoxious and just basically try and cause trouble, kick them out. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? If it was in your, if you had a party, if you had a party, and someone came in. I don't know, doing something that's just absolutely, irreversibly um, unforgivable. I don't know, like wearing a cowboy hat. You'd have to kick them out. You'd have to say, get out. That's it. Don't come back. You know? <laughs> Can you imagine? What do you mean, wearing a cowboy hat? There's nothing wrong wearing a cowboy hat. It's everything wrong with wearing a cowboy hat in public like it's normal it's not normal <laughs> it's not yeah uh 200 years ago but not now come on you don't see the indigenous population walking around with headgear and bows and arrows that's racist. That's not racist. That's that is, you know. Apache used to, you know, that's that's how things were back then. Just like you don't walk around with holsters and stirrups on your boots and stuff, <laughs> stuff like that. In this country, we we don't walk around with bows and arrows like Robin Hood anymore. We don't. Little hats with feathers sticking out. Dressed in green. I rarely dress like that. But that's our tradition. That That's, you know, if you go far enough back. Just like, you go to, if you go to Italy, they're not all dressed like Romans. But they used to be. Not all of them, but, you know, a lot of them used to be dressed like Romans. With all the, you know, the gear, the Roman costumes. They're not dressed like that now. They're walking around with shields. And with big feathery shoulders. 
you know. You go to Japan, you got people walking around dressed as ninjas. You see, see what I mean? It's, you know, get with the times, baby. <laughs> see, I think I covered myself with that. With something, I don't know what. I don't care. I do it care. I just think the cowboy, it is so big. The cowboy hats are so big. They're like twice the size. They're like sombreros. I mean, if you walked into a bar in Mexico wearing a sombrero, I imagine you'd be escorted out of that bar. Why you not let me in? I wanted to drink. That's uh, that's my Spanish, English. I can't speak Mexican. I don't know. How to I, I, I see there's something I'm a boxing fan right and I don't know why why it, it, I mean, this has been not bugging me but just it's a curiosity I have boxing announcers you know the, the man in the, or woman in the ring I say woman I've only ever seen one woman in the ring announce a boxing match um, but, no, that was a woman referee. And I don't think I've ever heard a woman announce a boxing match ever so far. It will happen. I've just never seen it. It probably has happened loads of times. I just, they don't show it on television. So, the ring announcer announcing the boxes. And when it comes to... Mexican fighters they pronounce the Mexican's name and where the Mex where where they're from with an Ameri with a Mexican accent. They try and say it in a Mexican not in a Mexican but with an American with a Mexican accent. Yeah, if the boxers from Africa or the boxers from France, or the boxers from Italy, or the boxers from Iran, or wherever. They don't do it then. You know, if the boxers from, uh, I don't know, from, there's a, and now, Antoine Corbalala is of, that's, that's Italian, uh, Francis Quasabon uh, from Calais, uh, from Franqua. They don't do that. They say, ah, uh, Bobby, whatever, from France. They don't even try and do an accent or try and pronounce the boxer's name with an African accent or with a Dutch accent. Or with a, Ger a German accent. They don't do it. But for some reason when it comes to Mexican. They do. And I kind of. I don't understand. Why don't they do it with all? And I'd love to see it. Because it'd be funny to watch. Especially if they get it wrong. Which they will. Because. There's no one at all. Well, I bet there's very few people in the world who have this skill and the linguistic ability to do like every accent and pronounce every name correctly, you know, and every uh, town and every, you know, there, there might be a couple of people in the world that can do that, but I can't imagine there's many. I can't imagine as many people that would want to and why would they need to but it'd have to be a, a a chore of love I guess but yeah it's, it's just something that I've wondered 
because you see the Americans like they're the because it's, it's such a big American fight and they got um someone fighting from Mexico. They say because for Canelo, for example, he's huge star, and all his fights are in America. Pretty much, he does. He comes to England as well. So if he fought an English fighter in America, let's say an English fighter went out there, the announcer would say, and it's a so uh, that uh, Canelo Alvarez. You get the from you know, putting on a, a Spanish accent and pronouncing his name with a Spanish accent, and you know where he's from in in all that stuff, yeah. But when they came to the English person, they say they're from Liverpool or from Scotland. They say from Scotland, they wouldn't say, and now Paddy McDavis. They like to say, now Paddy McDavis from Scotland. That's it. Not it was a, hey Paddy McDavis. They wouldn't say now Paddy McDavis from Hesshawja, Scotland. They don't put an accent. That's a very bad accent, but they don't even attempt it. Why do they do it with? Why do they do it with uh, Mexican? Why they you know? Why don't they do it if, well, why don't they do it with French? Why don't they do it? You know, that's my thing. Why don't they do it everywhere? Very strange. You know, he's very pretentious. <laughs> this is my... I watch a lot of boxing, so I, I know of what I talk. It's got to be another thing. I don't know if it's just America that do this, because... Most of the fights I watch are either American or English, in England or America. Very few big fights. I, I saw recently there's one in Australia. Um, but in America, because it's such a multicultural place, quite often they will have, uh, they'll have, for example, a non-English boxer fighting another non, uh, like a non-American boxer fighting another non-American boxer like for example Triple G Golovkin he's a huge star uh, or uh, Lomachenko another huge star or Canelo another huge you know huge star so they're all from other countries and they they might fight someone from Trinidad or they might fight someone from uh, Colombia, you know, for, as an example. So it's a huge fight. Both of the fighters from other countries. So they do, if it's, it'd be a world title fight, generally. So they, they play the national anthems. First of all, of the, the, um, the opponent, you know, the, the challenger. They'll play their national anthem first. Then they play the national anthem of the champion who is defending their title. I'll say his title because there's women boxers as well. So is him or her or whatever. But in America, they also have to play their own national anthem afterwards. Like Why? I never understood that. It's just, why? We don't need three. It's bad enough we have to listen to two. We don't need three national anthems. I don't think we need any national anthems. This is a boxing match. This is not a declaration of war. You know, this is just people. This is a sport. I know they do it in football. They do it in rugby, I think. Uh, so I but that's countries against each other boxing's not countries against each other it's just two individuals who happen to be from different countries on this occasion that's it they don't do it at Wimbledon they don't do it in tennis they don't do it in golf they don't do it in um, don't know if they do it in the UFC do they 
MMA, I don't, you know, why, why in boxing? I don't really get it. It just holds proceedings up. And then they get someone to sing really badly. <laughs> or okay, but it's, it's hard for them to sing it because quite often they do it a cappella. Um, and it's hard to do that when there's a lot of people. They probably can't even hear themselves singing. I mean, it's very difficult, I imagine, to do that. So they do get out of tune sometimes. and So I'm not judging that. I am, but I'm not. But I am, but I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not really judging it. But just it just takes time. I don't think it's necessary. I just don't I like just get on with the boxing, and then they change things depending on who's fighting. So, giving an example, Canelo Alvarez. Now he's a huge star in America. Well, worldwide boxing, he was the number one. I'm not sure if he's number one anymore in the pound for pound. Anyway, his recent fights, even when he's the challenger, the challenger for someone else's world title, he gets star billing, and he shouldn't. It's not, it's not necessary. It's not like they're going to get more people come and watch it. People are watching it. Fans of his will watch it, regardless of if he's first or second on the poster, you know, as, as far as names. But they have him go into the ring second. And tradition, tradition states that the challenger goes into the ring first, you know, before the fight starts. And then the champion steps into the ring second it's a tradition it's respect um, the challenger's national anthem or the challenger gets read out first and the champion you know details like their name and their boxing record the shout the champion gets read out second and then if there's a national anthem the national anthem of the challenger gets sung first then the national anthem of the uh, champion. And depending on which country you're in, the national anthem of the country themselves for some reason. Again, it, regardless if it's England or if it's China or if it's Spain, I don't understand why they, have, why they do that. It's got nothing to do with like, if people need a national anthem to, to hear that, to know where they are, then they really shouldn't be leaving the house on their own, should they? You know? If you need to hear the national anthem to know what country you're in, then you, there's something wrong. There's something wrong there. It's like, no, they play their national anthem, so we have to play our national anthem. He's, he's had a burger, so I've got to have a burger. He's got a new car, so I've got to have a new car. It's that kind of mentality. It's just, it's not a competition. We all know where we are. We don't need to put flags up. We don't have to have, this a couple of neighbours got English flags. Like, don't you know what country you're in? To be fair, it probably helps them find their way home when they're drunk, maybe, I don't know. Oh, there's the one with a flag. That's where I live. I live in the flag. I live there. I'm glad I put that flag up. I don't know the words to my national anthem. And I think part of the reason for that is because I didn't have to stand up in my classroom every single day of school and sing it. <laughs> if I had, it would be etched in my mind you know that would have been 
but there are songs that are in my mind some of the because in English schools well it used to be the case you know I'm talking about back in the 80s I don't know about now the we used to have assembly so what that was was the whole school would get together in one big hall and we would the the head teacher or deputy head would just blurt on about some crap and then we would then sing songs, hymns, uh, religious Christian songs. That was normal. I, I didn't go to a Christian school because pretty much all schools were Christian schools apart from those that weren't. Well, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? And what I mean by that is there were um, Catholic schools that were, you know, like my dad went to a Catholic school. Um, so I didn't go to, I used to live with Catholic nuns, so I, I used to be a Catholic when I was very little. But then all schools, pretty much most just general schools were classed as Christians because, you know, your first name used to be your Christian name. That's how things were back then in the 70s and even in the 80s. Uh, the idea of like what's your first name that that's quite a recent thing it used to be Christian name but then of course you know things things change and uh, all for the better I'm sure and there's other belief systems and it's I don't know what I don't know what this country is anymore when it comes to religion Lots of different religions. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, really, now. So I'm not really a Christian, although I'm kind of... I... I'm not going to talk about religion. Blimey. What am I doing talking about religion? But yeah, I, I do... Uh, I, still lo I, still, I still love Jesus. I can't help it. It's hard not to, but... Still, I used to love reading about him. But I am a Buddhist. From the Buddhist philosophy, I love Buddhist philosophy, the Buddhist teachings. Um, a lot of it does not fit into today's society, you know, In but a lot of things really do. So it's... I think with things like that, it's choosing. Some people say, no, it's not. Is you, if you're going to be in that religion, you need to do everything and take everything, at, you know, for its word. You need to believe everything that's been written. Which to me is a little bit dumb because a lot of things are very outdated. You know, they're not valid anymore. Not valid. And if you completely ignore the times we're in, I don't know, it just seems that it's causing problems for ourselves, making things harder than they need to be. Na 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 What am I talking about? This is supposed to be light hearted. While the question shouting practice is common for public appearances involving the president, Biden has expressed his frustration with the dynamic in the past. I don't blame him. I think it's annoying. And I think if he's making fun of him, good. Good, good, good on him. In fact, go further and kick him out. If someone's being obnoxious and rude, and let's face it, it, if you hold the highest position in your country of, let's say, 
360 million people. You kind of deserve a bit of respect from the press, you know. Just it just generally a little bit of uh, courtesy, not to be mistreated verbally, you know. Whoever you are, just it seems to very. To be fair, whoever you are, even if you're not uh, an important politician, just as a human being, doesn't everyone deserve a look, just a bit of respect, not to be shouted at, and to have people ask questions that they already know the answers to, and they're just shouting the questions out in order to antagonise the person that they're shouting at. That's another thing, you know, politicians get a hard time because they don't answer questions yes or no. But the reason they don't answer questions yes or no is because the questioner tries to be clever. So that either way they answer, they're going to come out looking bad. They, they do it purposely. They ask questions in such a way, and quite often is, do you agree that... And, you know, or they ask a question that's so multi-layered that there is no yes or no answer. And when you get a politician that does answer yes or no, there's usually that like, oh, it's so fresh. But they don't last. They get themselves in trouble. Because if you just answer yes or no to a question that's been asked in such a way, the question's been asked in such a way, that you, there's no winning. It can be interpreted in different ways. The answer can be interpreted in different ways, which means someone's going to get upset. Someone's going to read more into it. So, it's not that I, I feel sorry for politicians. But they're on a, a losing streak in the sense of they can't win. They might they might be ahead for a little while. Like Tony Blair was ahead for a little while, you know. People loved him for a, a few months when he first became Prime Minister. And now he's, he's not remembered very fondly by a lot of people. He's... It's kind of Churchill, although, you know, old Churchill the saint and all that stuff. People go on about how wonderful he is or was. But during his premiership, the second time, he was not liked. They kicked him out. And before he became prime minister the first time, he was not liked. He wasn't even liked by his own colleagues. People forget that. It's like, oh, he's the saviour of the world. And he was an amazing man. And I'm I'm not going to say anything bad about him, obviously. Because he, if it wasn't, well, he saved my granddad's life. Because he managed to end the war. And my granddad was imprisoned by, you know, the war. So... If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't exist because my granddad wouldn't have been released from the camp that he was being held by the Germans. So he wouldn't have had my dad and my dad wouldn't have had me. So I got Churchill to thank for that. Partly. And that wasn't just him. It was every, you know, it's lots involved. But, you know, if you're going to sort of, let's say, thank one man which is impossible to do, really, to thank just one person for an outcome. You know, ultimately, it was the soldiers. It was the the public. It was, you know, it wasn't just one person's decision, one person in charge of everything. But he was at the top. So if 
it hadn't been for whatever, um, I don't know that much about what Churchill did, but if it hadn't been for what he did and, you know, to end things, to, to, to end the second world thing, I wouldn't be here. So I owe a debt to that man. So people like to, like, you know, push down statues and stuff like that. Well, you realise you wouldn't be here. Mind you, a lot of those people might might have been here because they might not have... Uh, they might not have been affected by, by what happened in the past, but I definitely wouldn't have been here because my granddad would not have got out of that camp. He, he probably wouldn't have survived a few more months, to be honest. So, I'm here because of Churchill. I mean, I'm alive because of Churchill. Because, of, you know, he saved my granddad. And my granddad had my dad, and I don't have to go into that much detail. My nanny and granddad, they did a, they did a thing together. And then they had a baby... <laughs> And then that baby got older, and that, and then that was my daddy, and he did a thing with another person. They had a baby, and it was me. It was me. Yeah, yeah, me, me, <laughs> little baby Jason. And now I'm a hundred years old. Wow. Um. There's. Literally, there's, there's not one well, it says here Nicole, Nicole Kidman wishes husband Keith Urban a happy birthday in loved up photo. I mean, that's not a story, really. But you know what? It's a picture of them both looking happy. And lots and lots of people behind them in uniform looking happy as well. One particular one that I've just fallen in love with. Wow. Um, so I've got no idea. I'm not going to read the article, but... At least it's positive. It's a nice article. I mean, I can't say that Fox News website is any more negative than the BBC. It's on par. It, oh, what are, the, what are the odds of a white Halloween? I hope they're talking about snow. Yeah, they are. Um, apparently, in the US, the odds have changed about having snow on Halloween. There's an Alaskan-based climatologist, Dr. Brian Brett Schneider, or Schneider. Um, he says that there's a probability of a white Halloween, which is October the 31st. It's always, it's always October the 31st, isn't it? Like Christmas is December the 25th. When is, um, Easter's always like a random day, which is weird. Because Easter, for some reason, for some reason, in this country anyway, I don't know about others. I say that all the time because I generally don't. I mean, look, Chinese, China have their different New Year's Eve, don't they? New Year's Eve is a different time of the year. And they close on Tuesdays. Do they do that where you are? They close their restaurants, Chinese restaurants, close on a Tuesday. All through my life they've been closed on a Tuesday. Why? What's what happens on a Tuesday? That's my question. 
What happens? Does the whole of China close on a Tuesday? I, I, should, I could just Google it. I don't know why. I can't be bothered though. So. Is Thanksgiving Day the same day in November every year? Like 22nd of November or something? I don't know. Is it, is it the same date? But yeah, Easter has to be on Sunday in this country. So like Easter 25th, it doesn't matter what day of the month, what day of the week it, it lands on. It's the 25th regardless. And then the same is with New Year's Eve, whatever, dates, whatever day it's on, New Year's Day the same. But Easter always has to be on a Sunday. It's... I don't know how that came about. So which means Easter can't... It, it arrives on a different day each year. Like unless you know what day it's going to be, you can't necessarily predict it. You know, like you could say, so what, what date's Easter? 25th. That's it. Uh, February, is it February the 14th? Is Valentine's Day. Now, in England, we have November the 5th, which is Bonfire's Night. So you don't have that I think anywhere else, but in, in England. Maybe Scotland as well, I don't know, Wales. And that was a celebration of a terrorist attack. Well, uh, um, an evaded and avoided terrorist attack on the House of... Parliament, I think. Apparently, if I remember rightly, the gunpowder, they had to put these gunpowder barrels underneath the House of Parliament. I think they all got mouldy or got wet and they wouldn't have gone off anyway. But they were discovered or something. That's my memory of it. But it kind of might have been partly made up as well. I'm known to do that sometimes. I don't know. It seems a bit weird though to celebrate a failed terrorist attack which at the time would have been one of the biggest terrorist attacks in this country, history. You know, blowing up the House of Parliament where all the Prime Minister and the, you know, all the Parliament live or, you know, not live but go that would have been absolutely it would have changed history well it wouldn't have changed history but it would have changed the future from that point onwards you can't change a future can you you know what I mean it would have <laughs> things would probably be different now than they would otherwise have been you know in a way that we could it might be unrecognisable. So, Guy Fawkes, or Guy Fawkes Knight, so Guy Fawkes was the man who was the, the naughty man. But it's weird that we celebrate it, first of all, by having bonfires, which is how Guy Fawkes got, I think he got burnt. That was his... Uh, so we put on a fire. So we we get Guy Fawkes. We have these little made up figures of humans and we put them on it. I mean, that's just kind of a bit sick, really, isn't it? And then if the terrorist attack on the House of Parliament had been successful, it would have caused complete, you know, things going everywhere, Boosh, poof, all that stuff. So we celebrate it not happening by, we're having fireworks, which is basically mimicking what would have happened had it been successful. I mean, is, why not just go the whole hog and just have a miniature version of the House of Parliament? And just blow it up, you know, as a 
this because that's what it's it's weird you know we're mimicking what would have happened if it had been successful by having fireworks it's a very strange way to and how did it become a celebration like a firm date in the English calendar I mean, there must have been other other things that have happened that were equally as important but didn't get in the calendar. Why that one? I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. It surprises me. I just don't get it. There's got to be... Uh, I don't know. It's very surprising. Everything surprises me. But yeah, that's that's the history behind Guy Fawkes and November the 5th. And then, of course, you've got Halloween 31st. So, I mean, that, that tradition comes from us anyway, from England. Uh, as does cricket, as does football, as does many things. Because, let's face it, most countries were us. Well, well not most, but a lot of countries were us. America. Australia, India, for how many hundreds of years, 200 years, was it, We're owned, but you know, we just, we owned half the world at one point, so I say we, not me, not me, not me, I didn't do anything, don't blame, don't blame me, I had nothing to do with it, I don't own anything, I don't own countries, but the country I'm in used to. The only problem we had really is we didn't have enough, well, there's lots of problems, but we didn't have enough people. You can't, you got to have more employees. If you can have lots of, com lots of companies and branches all around the world, you've got to have employees in there to keep it going. We just didn't seem to, I think they rested on their laurels a bit. I mean, it's a shame. It's so nice to, it's so nice to have places to go on holiday. You know, I think I'll go to, go to America, stay in my holiday home. I don't need a passport because it's part of my own country. That's handy. Ah, <laughs> I thought I'd go to Australia. Hong Kong, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, just in this short period, in the last 30 or 40 years, Hong Kong and Australia have been handed back. I think we still owned Australia. That might not be true. But they were definitely part of the Commonwealth or something. But we owned Hong Kong. We owned, or we were in charge of Hong Kong. We ran Hong Kong. We were the boss. We had we handed it over because I think we had it for a hundred years. I don't know why. Blimey, I've got no idea why. And you know what? I don't care. It's weird. I wish I, I wish I did, but I don't. I really don't. I mean, for me, telling the truth and just making stuff up, it's the same. It's all the same. It's just a bunch of words. Just a bunch of words. I don't care. No. I'm just messing around. So I'm going to go. So. Yeah. I, thought, I kind of find. It interesting. How things got to where they are. How. I'm quite interested in how America. Became so. Or how. Okay. How Halloween became so important in America. It's a big deal. As far as I've been told. I mean I've got a, quite a few American friends online. And they've told me Halloween is huge. Bigger than it is here. Much bigger than it is here. But then if you go to Mexico. Is it Mexico? They've got um, the Festival of the Dead or something haven't they? Which is just huge as well. It's like 
and then you've got um, other countries where they walk around that big uh, religious wall thing. Like millions of people go every year and walk around it. It's, I know it's not the same as Halloween, obviously. I'm not comparing the two. But it's just, I think it's kind of fascinating how we ended up with these traditions. That's, that's all. That's what I'm saying. It's just, I find it quite fascinating. Uh, how, yeah, I guess it's just, uh, just sociology, isn't it, really? It's just, I suppose if I, I could find out, couldn't I? I could just do a little bit of research and maybe study the subjects, but I'd rather just talk from ignorance, though, you know? It's, it's just easier. I'm not that bothered of what the facts are. I'm interested, but not interested enough to actually type into Google. It's weird, isn't it? And I've got the laptop in front of me, or the iPad, and I could search, but I just can't be bothered. It's, it's almost like lifting my hand and just, just, no. I haven't, yeah, it's just, no, my hand's not moving. It's just weird, isn't it? It's just, I don't mind, I don't mind made up stuff. It's fine. Because it doesn't mean anything. I can't be wrong if I make it up. I can be wrong, but... Yeah, I can be wrong, obviously. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself. Lots of love. Bye.